Hello, I'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with us once again for our online Bible study. We're in Psalms 27 tonight. So if you'd like to turn your Bibles to Psalms number 27. As you do so, I'd just like to thank you for your uh, prayer and concern for us as a family as we grieve the passing of Tracy's uh, mother. And so we uh, appreciate uh, the love that you've shown towards us. And we uh, would appreciate your prayers for tomorrow as uh, Tracy's mother's funeral is tomorrow. So we'll be joining online with on Zoom and uh, we're praying that the Lord would have his hand upon that service and all that is said and done and also for our family in South Africa and for Daniel, praying that the Lord would comfort uh, each and every one. So do you remember those who are unwell? Uh, pray for uh, Nina and Declan, pray that the Lord would have his hand of healing upon them too. Let's pray and let's uh, go to the word. Father, we thank you for your word, the blessing that it is to us. And Father, we pray now as we take your word that you would uh, help us to understand what we read and we pray that you give us the grace to apply uh, what we learn today to our lives. So bless us, we pray, and encourage us in the scriptures, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian life often uh, fluctuates between uh, walking on the mountain and rejoicing and being in the valley and going through a time of doldrums. Well, this is what we find in the book of Psalms here. And often we see how David uh, has this kind of an experience where he rejoices one day and the next he seems to be uh, doubting and somewhat fearful. So the psalm that we're looking at tonight is divided into two parts. On the one first part, the first six verses, you can see David uh, rejoicing and you can see him uh, somewhat uh, trusting and exercising faith in God. He's on the mountaintop. Well, the second part of the psalm, from verse 7 onwards, you see him in the valley and uh, somewhat fearful. And sometimes this is how it is in our Christian life, if we're honest. We saw this with Gideon on Sunday. You, you'll remember that we saw a, a difference between his public display of faith and his private deficiency of faith. And so we, we recognize this. We don't say it to excuse it, but we understand that sometimes uh, this is the uh, situation that we find ourselves in and we have to deal with. And so we, we want to be trusting God, whether we're on the mountaintop or in the valley. And so today we uh, look at this psalm and we can see uh, David going through these experiences. I trust that there's a lesson that we can learn and apply to our lives uh, from it. So we first see David trusting on the mountain. So let's read from verse 1. A psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat at my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing of a desire of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my own enemies round about me, Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. So we see firstly, David is expressing great confidence in God. He's uh, displaying his faith that he has in God. And we see three things about his faith in these six verses that we've just read. And we see that his faith is resting on three things. The first thing that we could say that his faith is, is resting in is his uh, personal, God's personal dealings uh, with David. Notice the pronouns in verse 1. David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
So David is speaking about a personal experience. David is on the mountaintop. He's rejoicing. He's expressing his faith in God and he recognizes God's personal dealings with him. Isn't that wonderful that we can look at our lives and and recognize how God has personally worked in our lives? This is true whether we're on the mountain or in the valley. We can be mindful of how God personally has worked in our lives. The prodigal son is a good illustration. We'll see actually a couple of times this evening. He's an illustration firstly when we think about his personal dealings with his father. He was able to, after he had wasted his substance in the far country, after he was, you know, feeding the swine and even wishing that he could eat uh, what the, the swine were eating, he, he was thinking to himself as to how his relationship was with his father was in times gone by, his personal relationships with his father. And that was greatly influential in him coming to himself and going back home. So it's a good thing for us to be thinking as to how God has dealt with us personally. It's our faith, the way that God has worked in our lives. The second thing that God, David's faith is resting on is not just his personal uh, relationship with God, his uh, personal dealings with God, but his faith is resting on God's past dealings with him. So he says in verse 2, When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So David's experience was in the past that even when his enemies were, enem- were, were many and his enemies were ferocious, that because of God's dealings, his past dealings with David, that his enemies stumbled and fell. They weren't able to do him any harm. So so David was able to recognize that in the past God had so wonderfully worked in his life. Now I think if you and I were to take the time just to consider God's dealings with us in the past, uh, we would be so wonderfully encouraged by that. And I I think we can probably highlight a few um, points in our path upon life's journey where God has has come through in a very great way. So I've never been one really to keep a diary and I suspect keeping a diary is a good thing, helps us to remember God's past dealings with us. But even just reflecting back over my life, I can uh, can be mindful of certain highlights in my life where I can see God has come through uh, for salvation, where he's come through to keep me, for sanctification, where he's hand was upon me in calling me into the ministry, I can see certain highlights. And then even beyond that, I can see certain times where I was in a a very difficult situation and God came through in a wonderful way. And I'm sure you could say, well, that's the same for me as well. I can see how God has, in his past dealings, uh, worked in my life so wonderfully. And so with David, we can, on the mountaintop, we can rejoice in that, can't we? Our faith rests in his personal dealing with us. And our faith rests upon his past dealings with us. Like Samuel, we can say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. He has been so wonderfully faithful towards us. So our faith rests upon those two things. But like David, we can also say that our faith rests on a a third thing as well. And so it doesn't just rest upon his personal dealing and his past dealing, but it also rests upon his promised dealings with us. We're a people that take God at his word. We indeed do, like the hymn says, we stand upon the promises of God. And our faith rests in the wonderful promises that God has given to us. So in verse 3, we see David doing just that. He says, Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, will I be confident? So notice he's saying, and he's very clear here, he's saying, I will be confident in this thing. He's saying, I will be trusting in this. Now what is he trusting in? Well, he's trusting in the fact that God has promised him the throne, that he's been anointed, that he is to be uh, the next king over Israel. So even though he is uh, 
on the run at the moment. He was like an outlaw king to some degree, you could say. He had been anointed, but he hadn't been crowned. Uh, he was promised the throne, and he was resting in that. Saul uh, hated him, was jealous over him, was hunting him uh, for his life. But David was able to rest and just trust in the promises of God. He knew that his future was in God's hands. And God is always true to his word. So he was resting in his word. So that's three things that our faith rests in. God's personal dealings, his past dealings, and his promise dealings with us. And it's great that we can rest upon the promises of God. You know, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we, we stand upon the promises of God's word. We take God uh, to be true to his word always. And our faith rests in that. So that's the first thing we see. He's on the mountaintop there and we can see his faith resting in God. The second thing about his faith, I like you to notice is that his faith was yearning for God. He was resting, but he wasn't complacent. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. So David's faith was wanting more. And so... Here's the strange thing about our faith and our lives and development as Christians. On one hand, we can be satisfied and be totally happy with who we are and all we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the world, we, there was a time where we were always hungering and thirsting after something that never could satisfy but uh, our faith has settled on the Lord Jesus Christ and we find a great satisfaction from, that comes from that. But this, here's the strange thing, is that while we can be truly satisfied, there is also within us a yearning for a growth in our lives. There's a yearning to go deeper into the Word of God. There's a yearning to be closer to our Lord and our Saviour. There's a yearning to be used more of our God. So at the one hand, we can say we are satisfied, but with that satisfaction, there is no room for complacency. Like Paul, where he said in the book of Philippians, he didn't consider that he had arrived, but he was pressing forward. And so we want to be pressing forward. And, and you can see this with David as well. There was a yearning uh, for more in his relationship with God. So he says in verse 4, he says, and so it tells us here what he, he was yearning for. And there were two things that really stands out to us. He says, firstly, in verse 4, he was desiring the presence of the Lord in his house. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So he wanted the presence of of the Lord in his house. Now, when you think about what David was requesting here, what David wanted here was something that was impossible. He may have been a, a man after God's own heart, and he may well have been a man that had a great passion for God and for the things of God, but he was a king. He wasn't a priest. And so what he was yearning for actually wasn't his to have. That was for the people that were born of the tribe of Levi. And specifically those that were born of the household of Aaron. So it wasn't his place. But you can see his yearning, his desire. And so he desired to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. Of his life. It was a great yearning that he had. And I think that it shows his heart, that he just, he just wanted to be where God was. And of course, as believers, I think that's a, a good desire to have, isn't it? Isn't it a desire of ours to be where God is? There's a, 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 we find ourselves in a bit of a conflict as we go through life's journey. 
where, like with Paul, where he says, I'm in a strait betwixt two, where I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And of course, the other part of it was to remain with believers and to be a help for them. So while we, we go through life's journey, we have a similar thing. We uh, go through life and we have a desire to live and to be a blessing and to love and to serve. Uh, but at the same time, there's a yearning to be with our Lord and our Saviour. And that's a healthy thing for us to be yearning for. And uh, I think as we yearn to be with our Lord and our Saviour, uh, along with that, there should be a yearning to be in the house of the Lord as well as we gather Sunday by Sunday with the Lord's people. David had a passion to be in the Lord's house. He said in Psalms 84 and verse 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. He, he said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So that speaks volumes of his heart. Verse 4 of our psalm goes on to tell us exactly why it was that he wanted to be in God's house. He says, so that he could behold the beauty of the Lord and so that he could inquire in his temple. So he's saying, I want to, I want to be in the Lord's house I want to be in the Lord's presence so I can behold his beauty and so that I can inquire. He was saying, I want to worship the Lord and I want to be instructed of the Lord. Now, when we come to church, that should be our desire. I want to see and behold the beauty of the Lord. I'm coming to worship. And secondly, we're coming to be instructed. This was David's desire in going to the house of God. May that be our desire as well. He also, in his desire, wasn't just seeking to be in God's presence to worship and to learn, but he was also seeking uh, the protection of the Lord in his house. So this is what he goes on to say in verse 5 and verse 6. He says, For in the times of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. So David was on the run, remember, and he was far from the house of the Lord. He was living in the mountains of Judah. But in his heart, he wanted to be in the Lord's house to worship God, to learn of God, and also he desired sanctuary in the Lord's house as well. So we know in medieval times it was often common for a person who was perhaps under the active displeasure of the king or of the monarch to find refuge in a church. The custom that they had in the middle medieval times was founded in the Old Testament where they had those um, seven cities of refuge a person who had killed somebody unwittingly as a manslayer you could say it wasn't premeditated murder they could find refuge uh, in that place of uh, the, in that city that had been designated well David wanted to go into God's house to find a place of refuge sometimes we feel just like that as well may not necessarily to ride and go into church to hide ourselves from people but we could say well we want to run and hide ourselves in God and uh, like the hymn says rock of ages cliff for me let my let me hide myself in thee we want to hide ourselves uh, in God and this is what David desired he was saying Lord let me hide myself in thee Verse 6, he says, And now shall my head be lifted up above uh, my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, I'll, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. This is the high point of his mountaintop. This is the peak of his experience. He is just looking to praise and give honor and glory to God. His heart is rejoicing and he's praising God. He's right at the top. But now suddenly, sadly, 
he falls down off the mountain top experience he stumbles and falls into the deepest of valleys and many of us have been just there as well one day we're rejoicing and something happens some catastrophe strikes sometimes just something happens on a personal note and we find ourselves no longer on the mountain top but we're down in the valley so david goes from trusting on the mountain to trembling in the valley let's read on from verse 7 Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, My face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So here we find him in the valley and we're reminded that oftentimes fear and faith live side by side. One day we are on the mountain rejoicing and praising and worshipping and the next day we're in the valley and we're trembling and doubting. I don't think we should be uh, allowing ourselves to have a roller coaster experience of faith one day faithful the next day doubting we shouldn't excuse it but sometimes this happens would to god that when we are in a valley and we find we're in a great time of difficulty that we continue trusting and rejoicing and serving the lord even though we may be in the deepest and darkest of valleys and notice david in the valley here and it, you can see that God is working in his life and you can see that God is seeking to bring him out of those spiritual doldrums as it were. So he says in verse 7, he says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. So here you see him in the valley and you can see that he's sorry for his sin. It's almost as if he's saying in his prayer and it's repentant. He's, he's saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I shouldn't be here. Uh, down in the dumps, but here I am, Lord. I, Lord, would you forgive me for being in this place? He was at a place where he felt rejected, as we have just read. He was in a time where he felt that the people that he loved and admired had somewhat cast him off. And it's a difficult thing to be rejected by another. It's natural to want to be accepted. And of course, when we find ourselves rejected, it does a great deal of harm. So he's in a in a dark place he's down in the valley and he felt that god had rejected him in verse 9 he says hide not thy face far from me put not thy servant away in anger thou hast been my help leave me not neither forsake me o god of my salvation i think it's interesting here that we can see he's down in the valley but he's still filled with faith he's still looking up to god he's still trusting in god but what he's experiencing what he's feeling is that god had somewhat rejected him and sometimes we feel like this too sometimes we feel that when we pray it's almost as if our prayers go no further than the sound of our voices and when we praise sometimes in those valleys it seems that it's coming from a heart that is too dull to echo a voice of praise to god and when we feel that we're far from God to compound matters, we feel often then that we are having difficulties with other believers. We feel somewhat estranged from them as well. And to crown it all, we just feel that God has left us to ourselves and he's not answering those prayers. And he's not hearing us uh, when we seek his face. We feel rejected. And he goes on in verse 10, 
and he, he speaks of not only as to how God had rejected him, this is what he felt, this wasn't true of course, but this is how he felt. He also felt that his family had rejected him. He said, when my father and my mother forsake me, he said, then the Lord will take me up. So we're not really sure why he would say that of his father and his mother. But uh, this was his experience. Whether they had at this time uh, passed away, or whether there was something in their lives that they didn't quite understand and grasp about David, I'm, I'm not really sure why it is. But he felt that he had been rejected by them. So he felt he had been rejected by God, felt he had been rejected by his friends and family. But even though he felt this, he was looking to God to work in grace. He was just trusting in how God was going to work. That's why he cries out, Hide not thy face from me. Put me not away in thy anger. He says, Thou hast been my help. So he's, he's expecting God to work, and he's trusting in and he's having faith that God would work. So he says, Even though they would cast me off, he says, The Lord will take me up. God is going to be gracious to me. He not only says that God is going to be gracious, but notice that he says he's looking to God for guidance. Because he says in verse 11, he says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. So he's asking that God would guide him. He, he recognized that he needed direction. So he was praying that God would lead him on an even path, a level path. He was praying that God would uh, help him through those difficult circumstances that surrounded him and give him the direction that he so dearly needed. When we're in the valley, I think we are more mindful of the fact that we need God's guidance and direction more so than what we need it on the mountaintop. That's how we feel, but of course I think we always need to be mindful that we need God's guidance and his direction. Verse 12, he's praying for deliverance. He recognizes that he needed God's help. Deliver me not over into the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. So he, he recognized that he need, needed God's protection. So even though people were saying false things about David, and they were breathing out cruelties to David, he was just tr trusting and resting in God's help. So he was trusting in God for his grace. He was trusting in God for his guidance. And he was trusting in God for his goodness while he was in this valley. And so as we come to the concluding verses of the psalm, you can kind of see as to how he's inching his way out of the valley and once again up the mountain of faith. He says in verse 13, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So even though he was in the valley, he brings trust uh, back into his focus and he's, he's relying, he's exercising faith in God and you can see it beginning to soar. He, he realizes that he's in a bad place and that's always a very helpful thing to do is to recognize when we're not in a good place. And he said, I, I would have fainted. He, so he knew that he was in a bad place, kind of like Asif when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. I, I, my foot and I slipped. So he recognized the danger. Uh, so he, he recognizes where he was, but the thing that strengthened him was in verse 14, where he says, he says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Here's the thing we often fail, because we don't like to wait. We, we want God to work on our timetable, but God's never in a hurry. We fail when we wait. Uh, in fact, with King Saul, he's... Failure, the reason why God had rejected him from being king was his absolute failure to wait. And so David learned that the thing that was going to get him out of this valley, back onto the mountain, was just to continue to trust in the Lord and to wait upon the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. And we uh, learned a great lesson there, just to wait upon the Lord. And as we wait, we don't wait doubting God. We don't wait fretting over what we're going through. We just wait trusting that the Lord is going to deliver us through that time. 
So we'll close there, and I trust that as you look at the psalm, we may just consider ourselves and just ask the Lord, you know, where are we in this? Are we on the mountaintop or are we in the valley? Are we trusting the Lord as we are on the mountaintop? And that's a good place to be. If we're in the valley, are we doubting and trembling? Well, to be in the valley is a bad thing, but to be doubting God is not a good thing. And so we need to just learn to trust in the Lord. And as we trust in the Lord and as we exercise our faith in the Lord, well, our faith begins to soar, as we see with David, as the Lord brought him out of the valley back onto the mountaintop. Wherever we may be, whether we be on the mountaintop or whether we be in the valley, may we just keep our eye upon our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless those uh, thoughts to your hearts. We look forward to seeing you uh, this coming Lord's Day. And uh, may the Lord continue to keep you and sustain you by his wonderful grace. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word, the lessons that we learned from it. And we pray, Lord, you'd help us to apply these uh, truths to our lives. And we'll thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Thanks for joining with us. Goodbye and God bless you.